is up, guys? Welcome back to the Rip City Rundown podcast. We are recording this Tuesday, June 25th, the night before the draft, around 7.15 Pacific time, just a couple minutes after news broke from Woj that Mikhail Bridges has been traded to the New York Knicks. We're going to go into that. I mean, we can jump right off the start, um, and we'll go into that a little bit. Um, we were planning on kind of last podcast, the one we posted, what was that, Sunday night? That was going to be our final podcast before the NBA draft, but we decided to do one more check-in before before this draft officially gets on because I think this is a really big night. Like, sure, it's a bad draft, but we're going to get into some more things. Like, just, it, this is a big night. Um, I was going to come into this one without any notes. I was just going to kind of go from the heart, but went down a rabbit hole and decided I've got a lot of new thoughts, a lot of thoughts that have kind of now been fully developed. And I think I'm finally like, I have my opinion going into the draft. It took me a month to figure out what exactly I wanted, but I got it. And if you're one of the people that are listening to this, uh, you get to hear it. So uh, West, let's first talk about this trade that just happened with Mikhail Bridges, let's quickly go over and how it kind of relates back to the Blazers from last offseason and Joe Cronin specifically. Yeah, so we don't need to get into all the details of the trade, but basically Mikhail went for more first-round picks than you would have thought. Uh, and I think if we're talking about it from a Blazers fan perspective, perspective you, you kind of look back at the time where Mikhail Bridges was being linked to Portland and you think to yourself, would I or would I have wanted Joe Cronin or the franchise to give up the farm for McHale when he probably wasn't going to re-sign anyway? So I think it's, I'm not going to say it's a good look for Joe Cronin because it, that's some that's some S-tier level positive spin for him. But I do think that he wasn't in the wrong for not dealing for him. And I think just because a star is Mike, like barely available doesn't mean that your team is in position to get him. And unfortunately, Portland is usually probably not in the better position because you can't ever really bank on someone resigning without like a promise beforehand, like Jeremy or something. I think it makes sense for the most part. Um, I think it's one of those things. Yeah. Like, you, like, I mean, really more than the most part for all the part, it just makes sense. Like, yeah, at the time, who knows? Maybe if Mikhail plays a season with Dame and the Blazers are good, then like he's great. He doesn't want to end up in New York, but we're at where we're at now and we can't go on hypotheticals. And what we see is Mikhail Bridges went for a ton. Probably not something the Blazers, it's worth trading for. And it's something the Blazers don't even have. We don't even have access to that many picks. So it's the, that's same, our thing. It's the same thing like OG went for what, three? First? Uh, no, 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 no. Pascal went for three. OG Sorry, was the one for right. no first round picks, but they got like RJ and the Knicks Pascal got lucky that they have for... a Canadian star that the Raptors would want. I think about it. Pascal went for three first and McHale went for like four first a future unprotected swap, something like it's crazy that I mean New York had to overpay to get the Nova boys, and that's great. McHale, that's gonna be a fun, fun team to watch. But yeah. you can't can't be mad at a GM for not trading for someone when it doesn't make sense to your franchise. And I think we all knew that deep down. At least I kind of knew that. But of course, you hold out hope that a mm-hmm. Nets GM is dumb, for example. You hold out hope that we're dealing with a Bulls GM and you want Josh Giddy for Caruso. You hope you're dealing with Neil Shea. <laughs> yeah. Um, another interesting piece about this, and then, then we're done with this trade because at the end of the day, it doesn't have much to do with Portland. They just, there's small links to Portland. The Houston Rockets are involved in this deal too. They're sending the Nets, their picks back. So the Nets will send Houston the Suns picks because the Suns want to trade the Suns picks back to the Phoenix in hopes to get Kevin Durant. And long story short, the Rockets want to be aggressive this offseason and they want to make a playoff push. That's an interesting thing when talking about the third overall pick. And if the Blazers possibly, like I've seen people say that they might be interested in a Jeremy Grant, a Malcolm Brogdon, or just getting out of that pick in general. So we can go into that. Um, in a bit, or we can go ahead and go into it now. It's a um, jumping off point. Let's go. Let's go. What 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 we what do you got to say about that? <laughs> what do I got to say about well, that? Well, well, well. Da, 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 da. I think that trading up for the number three pick is an interesting thought, and I was all on board for it on Sunday. Then I've discovered that it seems like Sar is a lock to go to to Washington, and I just don't know. I don't know who Portland's number one guy is, but I feel like you can get a Cody Williams or a Saloon at seven 
and that's you're going to draft all along. Why would you trade up to three if Sar and Reese Alshair are gone, and now you're picking between like I mean, unless you want to go get Klingon, which is fine. If you want to go get Klingon, then go get Klingon. Klingon's not my number one. So if I was the GM, that it just doesn't make sense. Like I would almost rather trade up to one and get Sar, which sounds yeah. stupid. In every other draft, it's like, oh yeah, of course you want to trade up to one. But like Atlanta has like they have no idea what to do. Like they lucked out, and now they're like. 99% probably going to make the wrong pick. It's just unfortunate. I have so many ways I can go because I like when I tell you I have been just deep in a rabbit hole of so many different things over the past over this past day. Like there's so many things I want to just like gloss over here and quickly talk about. But the very first thing I'm going to talk about is just the obvious. The only way I leave tomorrow night mad at Joe Cronin is if we draft a guard. Like, that's a genuine thing. Like, we can't do that. You sent me that, you sent me and Cody that uh, paragraph that someone wrote. I would assume it's just someone wrote. I don't know where it was from. But they they were basically like, the Blazers decided to rebuild because they couldn't win with with two offensive-minded guards as their centerpieces. They've decided to redo that rebuild with offensive-minded guards as their centerpieces. So what the Blazers need in this draft is wings, defense, a little more size, a little more defense, and a little more dose of defense. There's a lot the Blazers need, but none of that includes guards. So that's the only way I will be mad going out of tomorrow night. And if we draft Zach Edie at seven, and probably 14 too, but because we, we're link, we, we like Edie. That is what I have read, and that is what I've heard. We are interested in Edie, which we can go into as well. If the Blazers trade up for anybody that's not a guard, and Edie just, I just don't think he's that good. Or I don't think he can be a guy that can be a starter for the next foreseeable future. But to get to the point, I'm rambling right now. No matter who the Blazers trade up for, if it's Reese Ache, if it's Holland, if it's Buzelis, if it's Saar, no matter who they take if they don't trade up for it, I am going to be like, okay, Joe Cronin, all I can do is trust you. Because you went into this rebuild, you hired Mike Schmitz, because you basically are saying we have a better chance of getting the guys we think can win a championship in the draft than in a trade for a star. We're going to hang our hat on talent evaluation and getting guys in the draft. This is kind of, you went into this rebuild because you were confident that you could get, I'm not even going to go championship route. I'm like not going to be unrealistic here. You are confident that you can build a good team through the draft and with your talent evaluation. So, I'm going to trust you to go get the guys you like. If that means it's Dalton Connect and Yavez Missy, then that's who it is. I'm not going to be mad. Mm-hmm. I'm going to trust it. I can have my my preferences. I can say I would rather this guy, but I know that if I'm going to if I'm going to ever trust Joe Cronin and be like you're my gym, then I just got to do it. And the draft is what the Blazers are going to hang their hat on. That's what everyone says the Blazers are best at. It's like they're not good in free agency. They don't make a lot of trades. They get their talent through drafting. So yep. that, that's where I'm at right now. So my to come back at that quickly, my number one thing is I need both players we draft in the lottery or whoever we draft in the lottery to be at least 6'6". Six, six. Yeah, no, that's sure. 6'6". Six, six. The second thing is more directed to you. You're saying you're going to trust Joe Cronin. I agree. We're going to hang our hat on evaluating talent and building to the draft. But you have to be ready to give these players, like like Scoot, for example, more than one year before you mm-hmm. poop on them. So that, the- you have to accept the fact that it can take three years for someone to become good. Look at Simons, Here's for example. Here's the difference with why I'm saying it specifically for this draft. I don't think there's nothing I'm not going to. Yeah, I probably could be not mad at Joe Cronin, but I'm not going to like congratulate Joe Cronin for drafting Scoot, specifically Scoot, because it was an overwhelmingly obvious choice. I I don't know enough about these guys and really no one knows enough in who's going to be good in this draft. So you got to trust your front office that they're going to do it right, specifically in this draft, because. I do think if the Blazers are going to separate themselves from these other teams that are rebuilding from the Charlottes of the world, from the Pistons, from the Wizards, it's in drafts like these. It's when the obvious pick isn't there. You brought in Mike Schmitz, who, like, you were pray you, you got so much you. praise for that hiring. And I think that if you're going to bring a guy like Mike Schmitz, 
this is the best draft for it. I know it could take time. I know it could take time. But what right. I'm saying is, okay, you can you brought in a Mike Schmitz type guy to make the not obvious pick to find the diamonds in the rough. So I think that it's paramount that you hit on one of your draft picks. Now that doesn't mean they're going to be a star. That means this guy is going to be at least a, we'll say, starter quality player for in the league for I don't know, an a, a eight years. Doesn't mean it's with the Blazers, but basically what I'm saying is like, this is one of those drafts. Like, if you don't hit one, and again, hit is a very relative term. You can take it however you want to. I'm not saying superstar. I'm not getting unrealistic here. I'm just saying like, good player that's going to be on your team for a while that can be a good starter quality role player. You have to hit on one of those because if you don't hit it this year, then you just kick the can longer and longer. That doesn't mean you have to get the star this year, but this is like, I think I'm starting to realize like this draft is. This is the most important night of the Blazers offseason. It, 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 when you're a bad team, it is. Now, yeah. you're talking about kicking the can down the road. You, the can, is, the can when we traded Dame, got kicked five years down the road, just so you know. Mm-hmm. So this can that we're talking about, like, if we draft two guys and they have a scoot-like rookie season, that's not kicking the can down the road. The, the can's already been kicked even farther because you got to give these guys time. So I don't stop. Like, I don't want you – Like I feel like you're partly sitting here saying that because Scoot had such a bad season. And you're now putting the onus on we're, us to get it right this year, when in reality, no, no, no. who knows what Scoot's going to do? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying this in a uh, one-year timeline. I'm not saying, like, if we come back next year and the guys we draft in this draft are bad, then I'm going to say it's a bad draft. Now, if Shaden's bad this year – and I'm probably going to be like, ooh, that 2022 pick, Shaden, like Shaden's, that might not have been a good pick because it's going to be his third year. Like, typically, if you're not good by your third year, you might not be that good. Scoot, you want to see improvement, but you don't need to be. Uh, I, I need to see. This year. I need to see 75 games from Sharp in a season before I judge him. Totally, yeah, but also you got to play 75 at some point. If you don't, that's what don't, I'm saying. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm. I'm not. If he has a bad year and plays doesn't have a great season. I'm not – I mean, he's played probably one season. Yeah, I know. He that's, what no that's, that's what I'm saying. For next year, if Sharp comes out of next year and still, like, hasn't shown that he's, like, kind of a core piece, not the centerpiece, just a core piece of the future, then we're going to have to start having conversations about Sharp being, like, actually a guy you can build around and having conversations that if, like – because we can say right now it's a good pick. But I'm so just is saying Sharp on the good. table tomorrow night? Is what? Is Sharp on the table tomorrow night? When, what, how would you get that from what I'm saying? I'm just asking. No. Okay. Well, it's a, uh, everything's relative. For Is Sharp worth the number one pick to you? Oh, absolutely not. There's. I agree. Shoes, Sharp, Scoot. Bro, like, there's not a lot of guys there are, but. Would you trade Jeremy for number one? I, I think I would trade a Jeremy. I, wouldn't, I don't think I would trade Aiden. Uh, any guy that you could see as a part of your future, like that could be a starter in the future. So, Anthony, DA, the two guards we really, Scoot and Shaden, I should say, uh, are off the table. But a guy like Jeremy's on the table. If you can somehow get get up Milk for the first overall pick, you absolutely do it. But what I'm saying is just like, I'm so, I, I, I think I've said over this time, like, oh, if we take Don Connect, ah, uh, I'm not going to be that happy. But like, this draft is so – there's so many ways it can go that, like, it's truly just, like, as long as you get a guy that obviously fills a position of need. Like, mm-hmm. if you take toe pitch, like, there's really no way you can look at that pick and say, gosh, that's going to be good. That's I, don't good. Even think, I don't even think you can take Castle. Which – I think we were talking about this offline. Like, that's kind of sucks. I like Castle. I think Castle can be really good. I, tr- I, I think uh, – Castle would I mean, be really good. Yeah, unfortunate, but you it's it's like we said this in the first mock draft. It's uh, that's oh, on me. It's okay. We said this in a um in the first mock draft. It's a positional it's a positional fit draft, yeah. and you, you've got to go get the guys that you think can fit into your team the best because there are not any home run prospects in this draft. Obviously, we've hit that so many times. That doesn't mean like there will be all stars in this draft. It's every draft. Mm-hmm. There will be a few. Um, it's interesting if the Blazers draft one. That's kind of what we're asking from Schmidt here. Schmidt and Crone. No, yeah, it's it's uh, and even one of these things like 
obviously you want to get some guys with a high upside, but if you're at 14 and you got a forward, if say you get just say you get Cody Williams, we're just throwing out that name. Say you get Cody Williams at seven. That's a guy that you can say has high upside and can be a great three or four one day. Then if you're at 14, like you don't have to, you, you don't have to swing for the fences. I want to be mad if they went for a guy that's like, like if you draft your role players now, I think that's something that the Blazers have been not great at in the past. We've got some great guys in the draft. We've drafted a guy like Shade and Sharp, or not Shade and Sharp. We've drafted a guy like Damian Lillard. We've drafted a guy like CJ McCollum, who have been great players, but I think we sometimes we struggle with drafting like our key role players. Um, like a lot of these guys, like, like get a Christian Braun, get a guy so you don't have to pay an Alan Crabb 70 million. Get a guy so you don't have to like say, Oh, we've got Delano Banton. He can be a part of the future. We signed Nick Stauskas to be a role player. Get your role players now because the only other way you're going to get them is by overpaying them. So turf, come out of here with a great role player. If that's what happens, if you get a guy that's going to be your seventh man for the next 10 years, might be a good draft. I mean, look, it's a, it's a really a low bar to clear for me in terms of what I want from this draft. Um, of course, the, the fan in me wants to see an aggressive move where we trade up and go snag a guy, but Again, it, it all comes down to, do we think it's worth getting this pick for this price? And mm-hmm. we'll, we're never going to know those conversations. We just know the end result. And so, of course, like this McHale thing, for example, we're pissed that Joe Cronin doesn't make a big move. And now we're like, wow, six years, or sorry, six firsts for, I mean, improving the roster, but not not getting to the upper echelon of the conference let alone the league i mean i'm sorry but mikhail on the blazers damon mikhail on the blazers is not beating milwaukee and i do think uh um, not beating boston sorry. there's a fine line between not judging their rookie year and then being overly judging like saying like it's okay if they have a bad rookie year and then on the other hand saying we're screwed he had a bad rookie year you don't want to get in this cycle of it's okay. They had a bad first two years because they can be better because like odds are, if you're better, your rookie year, you're going to be a better player. The guys that are good, their rookie year are more likely better than the guys that aren't good. Their rookie year. So Michael Carter Williams. I mean, <laughs> yes, there are, there are a few examples, but I, I do think that there's just, there's just, so, oh God, there's just, I'm deciding which way to go here. There's just so many ways we can go that it's so hard, like you're saying, and like I'm saying, like it's so hard to judge what they actually do. Like, come our pod tomorrow night, it's going to be hard to judge and say, "Gosh, we missed on these picks. These are terrible picks." I'm so mad because, like, if we drafted Amon Thompson over Scoot Henderson last year, we would have been pissed. So, you can get reactionary takes on draft night, but basically, what I'm saying is, like, again, the scale for hitting is however you make it. I'm going to say my scale is you get a guy that's a part of your core seven man rotation for the next. I'm not going to say for the next 10 years because odds are the guy's not going to stay. Next 10 years, but you know what I'm saying? Need, we don't need to put a timeline on it. Our core seven, top seven rotation guy for an NBA team, you have to get one of those. You just have to hit a pick. You got, you got to just like when you get opportunities, it's very rare you get two draft, two lottery picks. You got two swings. You got to hit one of them. Um, Got two again, early like, seconds too. Two early seconds, yeah. Like we can trade two seconds and fourteen and get up to nine. Like there's, we're gonna have our opportunities. And again, I'm not saying like you have to hit and we have to know if we're gonna hit come draft night next year. Just like in the grand scheme of the Blazers over the next ten years, we need to look back on this draft and we need to say that was we got one good player out of that draft. I agree. I agree. I agree. Exactly. I don't have much. To- don't have much to add to that. It's truly a draft where you just have to make your team better because right now this is really the only avenue you have to do that. So and you need to you need to like stand on this. Uh, like you need to like make this your thing. Like make like be be good drafting team. This is where I mean, the Blazers. Says that, but I hear what you say. But like this is truly where I think the if I had to rank teams on who I think could be the best drafting teams. This is where I think the Blazers can separate themselves from these other teams because they clearly like in the past. Joe Cronin's been in the building for since like 2006. He's been a part of Blazers organization. He's just, 
he's been a part of the conversation. He wasn't the guy to make the decision, but he was a part of the conversation to draft Roy, to draft Aldridge, or to trade for Aldridge on draft night, to draft Dame, to draft CJ. So, like, the Blazers, I think, are an above-average drafting team for the most part, if not top 10 over the last two decades. So, like, you also bring in a guy like Mike Schmitz who, like, yeah, he's a great evaluator of talent. He's, mm-hmm. But he also, this is his first time, first couple years, a part of an actual organization. So, like, take that great drafting ability, take that great talent evaluation ability, and, like, this is where you separate yourself. You find your guys. And I think, like, this is a this is the exact type of draft where the Blazers can be far and away better than these other rebuilding teams. Because some, sometimes, like last, like last year, nothing. The I don't think there was anything the Blazers did that, like Joe Cronin, didn't do what, or did do exactly what all twenty nine other GMs would have done when it comes to drafting at the third pick. Every other GM would have taken taken Scoot, which, so that, right, what, which he was right to do, rightfully so. Like when it comes to what he was actually drafting, so like you can't get mad at him for making the pick, but you also can't necessarily be like, oh, you found some elite pick, you. You, you had a great value pick. Like you can do that at fourteen and seven, and I think like this is this is a great year to do it. Again, yeah, like you said, it's going to take a while to know if it was the great right pick or not, but it's a great year to do it. Yep, and, and quite frankly, like you said, this is a this is a diamond in the rough draft. So go find your go find your diamond. And I'm just for me, I'm more excited just about this. Is probably the most excited I've been in just not knowing what's going to happen. So that's what's exciting Great. for me. Edie, just I just want to quickly get your thoughts on Edie. If they drafted Edie at 14, what is your reaction? Is it <laughs> I, I'm your honestly, reaction is if we drafted a guard? If No, it, it's, it's better than getting a guard. And the dude's 7'4". I mean, he's 7'4". Of course, there are vi- like very real concerns about his perimeter shooting and his perimeter defense, quite frankly, just anything on the perimeter for sure. But in college, at least, I mean, the dude, like, let's not forget, like, Klingon couldn't guard him. Like, really? And Klingon might be going number one. I mean, okay, we're talking about, like, Iguodala guarded LeBron. Uh, yeah, gonna, yeah, yeah. It's like one of the, like, Edie got his numbers. So I think Edie, I just think the scary thing with Edie is your, if, if you pick him, you're kind of locking yourself into a play style for a while. And that's, I don't know. That's exactly and, how I feel. And I don't know if it's the play style that is successful in the modern NBA. Not that's, saying he's a bad player. That's but. literally the perfect way to do it. I think his ceiling is like Jonas Valanciunas. Which is great. Which is like, if he ended up being Jonas Valanciunas, sure, that's great. But when Jonas Valanciunas is on the floor, you have one play style you can play on offense. And that is, have one guy, you clog the paint with Jonas and yeah. you have to surround him with shooters. Or else, like, you're not successful, probably. Yeah, and I think five, like five outs of the future, obviously. We saw Boston do it this year. Um I'm sure you, you, of course, you can win other ways, but Zach Eady just doesn't provide a lot of offensive flexibility in a league that is dominated by offense. I think defensively, he'd be sick. You just would have to play drop coverage. Yeah. Um, if I had to like rank like the levels of emotion I would feel with each, I like, really, I wouldn't be, draft. I wouldn't be pissed at Eady. I would just be like, wow, we're really committing to this. And I don't know how I feel about yeah, it. Yeah, it's like guard here. And I think like the more I'm thinking about it, like it is so unrealistic that we draft a guard. And if we do, like all hell will break loose from Portland Trailblazer fans because that's like, that would be wild. And I don't even want to go down that road. I think that's really like a near zero possibility. Then it's a guy like Eady, especially if we draft him at seven, which has also been rumored, which is very interesting. Um, but again, so many rumors in this draft. Just a week ago, Star was minus two thousand to go one, and now resale shares like minus three hundred. So, so many things can change in the matter of weeks, and most likely in the matter of days, and most and now matter of hours. So, yeah. look, if we drafted Edie, I wouldn't. I, I think that would be one where we would come on the podcast tomorrow, and I would be like, "Why? Like, it's just, I don't like that. It's not fun. It's like, uh, you're locking yourself into a play style. I'm not gonna." have a pitchfork out and be so pissed at you, Joe Cronin, because like, yeah, at the end right. of the day, ED, like people are saying like Luca Garza is like ED, but ED definitely is better and ED is taller he's and a better defender. Else. He's better. He can move a little better, but still he is of that type of mold. Back to the basket centers in college basketball tend to not do great. Look at like Jalil Okafor. 
And whatever Steph, the was, thing, though, is he, like he the dude is seven four, and like you're talking about how many if we draft him, how many other teams can meet Wimby at the rim? Yeah, but I'm, I'm just saying. Okay, fair. Yeah, the seven four thing is definitely interesting. Um, uh, when it comes to guys I want to draft, I would be ecstatic with Cody Williams. I'm still in on Ron Holland. Like, I still think he can be a great player. If we drafted Buzelis, I wouldn't be mad. Um, something about Saar real quick that I was just, I was kind of just diving more deep into Saar, let a, not just the highlights, just more like his entire just like come up as a player. And an interesting thing that you don't need to read into it deep too much, but just hear me out. He plays, um, signs for Real Madrid when he's like, how, whatever, 16, 17, 16, 15. Um, and then as soon as Real Madrid, like he struggles a bit at Real Madrid, he goes to overtime elite. Then at overtime elite, they were saying like, he just wants to be on the perimeter. They had to basically like teach him how to go down low. Like say like, you got to go down low. This is still like 17 year old, 18 year old. He decides to not be like Rob Dillingham, who was also at overtime elite. He decides to go to not go to college. He wants to go to the NBL, but he never starts in the NBL. He's a bench guy the whole time. He never really develops the shot that much. And he only shot 48% from the paint this year. And now he doesn't want to work out for the Hawks because he kind of just wants the rumor is he wants to go to Washington because that's where he can kind of be the most free to take, to do whatever he wants and kind of like take reins of the offense. It's a very interesting thing. It's, it's on one hand, you can say he just wants to go to his best, best case scenario possible. And he's always just trying to set him up to be a high pick in the draft. And he wants to be, in Washington because that's where he has the most control. But you can also look at it as it as kind of running from the grind and like not really wanting to ever be challenged. Just kind of continue to go to the easier and easier thing. It's an interesting yeah, thing. I don't I don't really care about what I'm not gonna read into that. To me, it just what I take away from that is we're talking about a guy who shot doesn't have a great stroke and didn't shoot that efficiently in the paint as a number one overall pick. Like that's just where this draft is, guys. So that's I mean, we're asking Joe Cronin to find the diamond in the rough in a Buns draft. So the word is kind of one. one. It's so one of those things where if Joe Cronin ends up taking Alex Sar, he's a position of need, and I'm going to trust Joe and Mike Schmitz to, because I think like I develop. It's a, all it's a you can do. Draft. All you develop. can do, and maybe Joe Cronin's a great drafter, but we are a bad developing team. Who knows? Who knows? So I mean, that go into this. Yeah. Anything else? Um. No. I think uh, – let, let me just go go in my notes real quick to make sure I said everything I want to do. Literally, I said uh, one bullet point I made was this is how you separate yourself. These type of drafts, you choose to rebuild, so this is the most important night of the season. Don't effing miss. Yeah. Because, like, again, like, you get, as the Blazers, you chose to go down this path. So – you chose to go down this path. I hope with confidence that you were a good drafter and you could get you could get us out of this rebuild, get us out of this just bad basketball, get us out of this hole by drafting. So I'm going to trust that you're going to be successful at drafting. And again, that's on a scale for this draft. But mm-hmm. like you said, there's going to be some all-stars. There's going to be plenty of role players in this draft. And the Blazers don't come up with one of them. Then I hope by then, by the time we know that's the case, Joe Cronin is out of here. So... I mean, if that's what you want. It's exactly what I want. It's crazy. Every draft has great players. I agree. And Go get one of them. Would, I, 29, that's, 29 other teams are fighting for that too. So hopefully we're the ones that do it. And I'm going to be, I mean, tomorrow I'll be excited regardless if we pick, if it's a position of need, because we're not going to know the answer for a while. So that's, that's a, I'll, I'll end with that. I'll end with that. All right, that's it, guys. Um, my final prediction is Klingon's going to go one tomorrow. And I think Sar is going to be available at three. Do the Blazers go up for him? I don't know. But that's my final prediction. I think it's going to be Resal Klingon at one, Sar at two, and Resal Share will go. Actually, I think Shepard's going to go three, and Resal Share is going to be available to, for someone to go get. Because you don't really want to pair Resal Share with Wimby if you're the, if you're other teams. You don't want to do that. Yeah, you don't want to allow that to happen. But the Spurs would be loving that. Um, the French connection. That's going to do it, guys. Uh, just quick podcast. We will be back tomorrow night um, and let us know exactly who you want in the comments below. If you're watching on YouTube and if you're listening on Spotify, uh, go talk to us on Twitter. So 
That'll be it, guys. Peace.